Hi friends, welcome to Sacred Earth Essentials. My name is Stephanie Lingenfelter. Thank you for being here today. Um, today's episode is a first of many and it is called Sacred Sharing. So Sacred Sharing is going to be our talk show where myself and guests discuss our stories and share our journeys through life, and um, our joys, our trials, our tribulations, and our paths of healing. Throughout many cultures, the art of storytelling is considered a sacred tradition. And I would like to be a part of carrying on the sacred tradition of storytelling. I know that for myself, there have been numerous people who have lent a listening ear uh, throughout my life that have helped me to feel welcome, that have helped me to gain self-reflection, that have helped me to heal, and that have helped me to become a better person through both the sharing of their sacred stories as well as through giving heart and time and space and attention to the listening of mine. I am trained in counseling. I have a master's degree in psychology and counseling, and I am also an herbalist. In both of those areas, I am a lifelong student and continuing to study. Um, one thing that I've found in the practice of counseling is that when I'm practicing as a clinical counselor, it is not encouraged to self-disclose details about your own life or your own story. And because of how healing it has been for me to share my story with others and to gain feedback from them that, that has been helpful um, on their healing journey, as well as knowing how hearing other people's stories has helped me, I've decided to create a special talk show on Sacred Earth Essentials that is dedicated to the sharing and listening of stories. So today is the first episode of that, and I am both your hostess and the guest. So part of my part of my story that I would like to share with you today has to do with how I met Rosemary Gladstar. She is one of the most beautiful humans I've ever met in my entire life. And this episode is dedicated to the hope that Rosemary has planted within me, among many other beautiful gifts and skills. And so I have finally come to the place within myself where I now am embracing the fact that I not only must, but would love to and feel joy in sharing my story and the knowledge and wisdom and experience that has been imparted and gifted to me over the years, and including the struggles, um, because I think that it's important to be authentic when sharing um, oneself with the world. And I think that there is healing power in that authenticity. So Rosemary Gladstar, if you don't know, Google her, you should know. Um, she is the godmother of modern day herbalism. And I strongly believe that if not for Rosemary, herbalism would not be what it is today and what it is, you know, growing into in today's world. And herbalism is an ancient art that precedes modern medicine. Um, I am not advocating for the lack of modern medicine. I ab advocate for the, for the herbalism and the modern medicine to complement each other um, because they, re they really do. So when I was finishing my undergrad studies in Pennsylvania before I moved to Vermont in 2007, I had the opportunity to spend a six months almost in Spain studying the language and the culture and the history. And while I was in Spain, I was introduced to linden tea um, from my Spanish mama there, um, Tilia. And I never had heard of it before. I, I, I had heard of chamomile tea, but quite honestly, prior to 
beginning my studies of herbalism, I, I did not have a lot of knowledge of plants prior to that. Um, so that combined with my other curiosities led me to buy a book, um, The Green Pharmacy by James Duke, where I began studying about plants. I had always loved nature and I always knew that let thy medicine be thy food and the food be thy medicine. Um, I always knew that everything that we need as a species to live healthy, harmonious lives is at our fingertips around us if we could connect with it and with each other and ourselves um, in healthier ways. And I think that's part of evolution and that's part of where we are right now in the world um, as a species. So hopefully we can, you know, make that that leap through to this next higher level of consciousness, which is a big part of who I am, what I've been through, and what I'd like to offer people here at Sacred Earth Essentials, which for me is a big leap um, because I've spent many years hiding who I am for reasons that maybe we'll go into a, another day. <clears throat> so in Pennsylvania, I'm beginning to study plants and I start learning about Vermont. And I hear that there's a lot of people in Vermont that are into communities and, and just plants and, you know, living with the earth and all these things that I didn't have access to growing up in suburbia. I, I grew up in, you know, with a lot of MTV and Cosmopolitan and, you know, wasn't allowed to watch things like The Simpsons and stuff like that. So when I was finally able to like really leave the nest, I, I moved to Vermont and wound up in Plainfield, Vermont, um, which I had never heard of before. And I had never heard of Goddard College. And I, you know, a lot of people there are into fish and no offense, like, I had a not so great experience at a fish concert when I was 19 and so ever since then I get a raging headache whenever fish music comes on. So it was just really ironic that I wound up here at this college, Goddard College, that I'd never heard of before and was on this quest, you know, this search to study plant medicine in community and I have always respected and had a strong place in my heart for the idea of apprenticeships and hands-on learning and skills and knowledge being passed on, you know, from generation to generation. So I came to Vermont to find that, and I had never heard of Rosemary before. So after I wound up in Plainfield and at Goddard College, I decided that I was going to give away, you know, all my belongings that I could. I kept my car and some clothes and things. And I rented a cabin that did not have running water or electricity in it on this small organic farm in northern central Vermont. And was introduced to a subculture in the United States that I had never heard of before. Um, that maybe we'll get in, like I, the Rainbow family and people who follow the Grateful Dead. And I am saying this with all due respect, as just part of my story. Um, but I, I didn't really grow up with too much of that. I think my dad had like one Grateful Dead CD. And my parents did a really great job of, I, I feel like, kind of um, sheltering my access to knowledge to a certain degree. So this was like a big learning experience for me. And I was, I learned how to plant asparagus and garlic and I, you know, had spring water and there was like an acre worth of blueberries and it was like heaven for me at the time. You know, I thought it was this, this great thing. And it was really just the beginning of a journey that has led me to where I am today. And so it was all of those experiences, all those stories that I hope someone out there can find some joy and some solace and some healing and connection in. And so as I'm living at this farm, there's the, the, the matriarch, the queen, the mother of the home who lived at the main house that did have, you know, solar powered electricity. Earth Dancer. If you see this, Earth Dancer, 
I have not seen or heard from her in quite some time. Um, she also taught me the acronym that, that GURU really just stands for. G, you are you, you know? Um, and how to come home to yourself. So this video and this channel is a part of me coming home to myself and sharing it bravely with the world. Earth Dancer had Rosemary Gladstar's book, um, Herbal Healing for Women, on her shelf, which was the first introduction that I had to Rosemary Gladstar. And as I turned the book over to the back, um, which I often start at the back of things for some reason, I see her picture and find that she lives 35 minutes away from where I was in Vermont, in, in Orange. Vermont. And I Google her and I find out that she has an apprenticeship program and an internship and this, you know, lovely, beautiful um, correspondence home study course, which is now also online. I recommend that any of you interested in studying the plants and what they have to offer you and our world, start with the science and art of herbalism. Um, this is a you know, one of the original paper copies, um, and, but the work that they've done online is just absolutely gorgeous as well. And so I decided then I was going to study with Rosemary, that that was what I wanted to do, and that was my path. And at the time, I was also enrolled in the master's degree program at Goddard College in Health Arts and Sciences, and, and I was learning um, a lot of both plant-based and historical and socio-political information that that was expanding upon what I had learned, you know, prior to coming to Vermont. And so I was very fascinated with all of this and, and very caught up in the idea of just dedicating my life to learning about plants and how to heal um, the world, what were the causes of suffering and how to help alleviate suffering. And in that process, have had to sit with my own suffering. So that's experiential learning for you. So things got, you know, things changed. Life happens. And I, throughout this journey and wanting to try certain plant medicines, um, specifically things like psilocybin and ayahuasca and San Pedro, um, you know, and, and cannabis is woven into all of this as well, um, as well as really tuning into the, the fine tuning, the sacredness and the healing that uh, plants that we may take for granted um, that are common have to offer us. And through that journey, I, I met the man who is the biological father um, of my son. And, and you know, I, Liam was conceived and that is again another story for another day but it was an unhealthy relationship at the time and became abusive and violent and it was during this time that I also applied to Rosemary's summer internship program at Sage Mountain um, in Eastbury, Orange, Vermont. And I thought if I don't do this now, I'm never going to have the time or the opportunity to do it again because I'll, I'll be a mother and I'll be taking full care of this child. And what professional organization accepts a mom with a young child, you know, especially coming from the mindset of more of a suburban city um, environment. But Rosemary accepted me, and she accepted me to the program pregnant, and I moved to Sage Mountain for the summer that May in 2011, and was introduced to the herbal community in full effect for really the first time, and was, fell, you know, fell in love in so many ways um, with Rosemary and the plants and everyone. So, as Brenny Brown says, <laughs> vulnerability is a good thing, right? 
mm, something along those lines. So I am using myself again as a model, as a guinea pig in an experiment to show you what it looks like to share and to be on a path um, of both healing for yourself and others simultaneously, that it doesn't have to be just one or the other. Um, so I did, I, I spent the summer there learning about the plants and helping and, you know, they all loved and helped me more than I could have ever imagined was possible. And they filled my cup at a time when I was so empty, I don't even think I knew my cup was that empty. Um, and so this channel and my work at Sacred Earth Essentials and my private practice, North Country Counseling, and my developing apothecary, the Vermont Herb Shop, and my cannabis consultation company, Higher Love Vermont, are all a part of me giving back to the world the gifts that were given to me during my time at Sage Mountain, during all of the time that I learned about the herbs and the plants throughout these years. Um, you know, this is dedicated to the community here in Vermont and internationally that I've met through the International Herb Symposium that happens at Wien College in Massachusetts, as well as the New England Women's Herbal Conference um, that I've attended throughout the last, my last 12 years here in Vermont. And so that's how I met Rosemary. And, you know, um, prior to meeting her, there were dreams that I had of conversations and things. Um, and I also, you know, actually prior to that, I met Rosemary in 2010 um, when I signed up to do the Sacred Plant Traditions Weekend workshop with Rosemary, Rocio Alacran from Ecuador, and Doña Enriqueta Contreras Contreras de Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, me encanta estas curanderas y siempre voy a tener gracias para estas mujeres. It's like, see, I will always be thankful for these women and what I've learned from them. So again, this is my attempt at giving back to the community. And I'm going to leave you with a story from the lesson two in the science and art of herbology, the, the home study course here from Rosemary. Um, so again, thank you for your patience with me as I navigate YouTube and the digital world and putting myself out there to you all. So Rosemary, to me, this video doesn't give justice to the love and admiration and appreciation that I have for her and her work. Um, but I will say that one of my goals here at Sacred Earth Essentials, where I believe that the earth is sacred and you are too, is to plant hope in others as hope has been planted in me and to give you hope and to tell you to never give up and to hang on and to reach out when you need to reach out because I know how hard it can get. I know how heavy things can feel and I know how desperately alone one can be and what that can do to one's mental, emotional, social, and physical health. I've had to learn over the years to receive the love that's been given to me, that it doesn't matter how much love is being given to me if I'm not open to receiving it. Um, so, so let this be my thank you to all of you who have sent me love over the years and continue to do so. Let this be both my giving, my offering, and my cup, my, my proof of receiving of these gifts and of this love that you have also graciously bestowed upon me and that I hope to pay forward to the world from this point on. The Man Who Planted Hope by Jean Giono. For a human character to reveal truly exceptional qualities, 
one must have the good fortune to be able to observe its performances over many years. If this performance is devoid of all egoism, if its guiding motive is unparalleled generosity, if it is absolutely certain that there is no thought of recompense and that in addition, it has left its visible mark upon the earth, then there can be no mistake. About 40 years ago, I was taking a long trip on foot over mountain heights, quite unknown to tourists in that ancient region where the Alps thrust down into province. All this at the time, I embarked upon my long walk through these deserted regions, was barren and colorless land. Nothing grew there but wild lavender. I was crossing the area at its wildest point. After three days walking, I found myself in the midst of unparalleled desolation. I camped near the vestiges of an abandoned village. I had run out of water the day before and had to find some. These clustered houses, although in ruins, like an old wasp's nest, suggested that there must once have been a spring, but it was dry. The five or six houses, roofless, gnawed by wind and rain, the tiny chapel with its crumbling steeple stood about like the houses and chapels in living villages, but all life had vanished. It was a fine June day, brilliant with sunlight, but over this unsheltered land, high in the sky, the wind blew with unendurable ferocity. It growled over carcasses of the houses like a lion disturbed at its meal. I had to move my camp. After five hours walking, I had still not found water and there was nothing to give me any hope of finding any. All about me was the same dryness, the same coarse grasses. I thought I glimpsed in the distance a small black silhouette upright and took it for the trunk of a solitary tree. In any case, I started towards it. It was a shepherd. 30 sheep were lying about him on the baking earth. He gave me a drink from his water gourd and a little later took me to his cottage in a fold of the plain. He drew his water, excellent water, from a very deep natural well above which he had constructed a primitive winch. The man spoke little. This is the way of those who live alone. But one felt that he was sure of himself and confident in his assurance. That was unexpected in this barren country. He lived not in a cabin, but in a real house built of stone that bore plain evidence of how his own efforts had reclaimed the ruin he had found there on his arrival. His roof was strong and sound. The wind on its tiles made the sound of the sea upon its shores. The place was in order. The dishes washed, the floor swept, his rifle oiled, his soup was boiling over the fire. I noticed then that he was cleanly shaved, that all his buttons were firmly sewed on, that his clothing had been mended with the meticulous care that makes the mending invisible. He shared his soup with me, and afterwards, when I offered my tobacco pouch, he told me that he did not smoke. His dog, as silent as himself, was friendly without being servile. It was understood from the first that I should spend the night there. The nearest village was still more than a day and a half away. And besides, I was perfectly familiar with the nature of the rare villages in that region. 
There were four or five of them scattered well apart from each other on these mountain slopes. Along white oak thickets at the extreme end of the wagon roads, they were inhabited by charcoal burners and the living was bad. Families crowded together in a climate that is excessively harsh, both in winter and in summer, found no escape from the unceasing conflict of personalities. Irrational ambition reached inordinate proportions in the continual desire for escape. The men took their wagon loads of charcoal to the town, then returned. The women nursed their grievances. There was rivalry in everything over the price of charcoal as over a pew in the church. And over all, there was the wind, also ceaseless to rasp upon the nerves. There were epidemics of suicide and frequent cases of insanity, usually homicidal. The shepherd went to fetch a small sack and poured out a heap of acorns on the table. He began to inspect them one by one with great concentration, separating the good from the bad. I smoked my pipe. I did offer to help him. He told me that it was his job. And in fact, seeing the care he devoted to the task, I did not insist. That was the whole of our conversation. When he had set aside a large enough pile of good acorns, he counted them out by tens. Meanwhile, eliminating the small ones or those which were slightly cracked. For now he examined them more closely. When he had thus selected 100 perfect acorns, he stopped and went to bed. There was peace in being with this man. The next day, I asked if I might rest here for a day. He found it quite natural, or to be more exact, he gave me the impression that nothing could startle him. The rest was not absolutely necessary, but I was interested and wished to know more about him. He opened the pen and led his flocks to pasture. Before leaving, he plunged his sack of carefully selected and counted acorns into a pail of water. I noticed that he carried for a stick an iron rod as thick as my thumb and about a yard and a half long. Resting myself by walking, I followed a path parallel to his. His pasture was in a valley. He left the little flock in charge of the dog and climbed towards where I stood. I was afraid that he was about to rebuke me for my indiscretion, but it was not that at all. This was the way he was going and he invited me to go along if I had nothing better to do. He climbed to the top of the ridge about a hundred yards away. There he began thrusting his iron rod into the earth making a hole in which he planted an acorn. Then he refilled the hole. He was planting oak trees. I asked him if the land belonged to him. He answered, no. Did he know whose it was? He did not. He supposed it was community property or perhaps belonged to people who cared nothing about it. He was not interested in finding out whose it was. He planted his hundred acorns with the greatest care. After the midday meal, he resumed his planting. I suppose I must have been fairly insistent in my questioning, for he answered me. For three years, he had been planting trees in this wilderness. He had planted 100,000 of these, 20,000 had sprouted. Of the 20,000, he still expected to lose about half to rodents or to the unpredictable designs of Providence. There remained 10,000 oak trees to grow where nothing had grown before. 
That was when I began to wonder about the age of this man. He was obviously over 50. 55, he told me. His name was El Zayard Bouffier. He had once had a farm in the lowlands. There he had his life. He had lost his only son, then his wife. He had withdrawn into this solitude where his pleasure was to live leisurely with his lambs and his dog. It was his opinion that this land was dying for want of trees. He added that, having no very pressing business of his own, he had resolved to remedy the state of affairs. Since I was, at that time, in spite of my youth, leading a solitary life, I understood how to deal gently with solitary spirits. But my very youth forced me to consider the future in relation to myself and to a certain quest for happiness. I told him that in 30 years, his 10,000 oaks would be magnificent. He answered quite simply that if God granted him life in 30 years, he would have planted so many more than these 10,000, and it would be like a drop of water in the ocean. Besides, he was now studying the reproduction of beech trees and had a nursery of seedlings growing from beech nuts near his cottage. The seedlings, which he protected from his sheep by a wire fence, were very beautiful. He was also considering birches for the valleys where, he told me, there was a certain amount of moisture a few yards below the surface of the soil. The next day we parted. The following year came the War of 1914, in which I was involved for the next five years. An infantryman hardly had time for reflecting upon trees. To tell the truth, the thing itself had made no impression upon me. I had considered it as a hobby, a stamp collection, and forgotten it. <clears throat> the war was over. I found myself possessed of a tiny demobilization bonus and a huge desire to breathe fresh air for a while. It was with no other objective that I again took the road to the barren lands. The countryside had not changed. However, beyond the deserted village, I glimpsed in the distance a sort of grayish mist that covered the mountaintops like a carpet. Since the day before, I had begun to think again of the shepherd tree planter. 10,000 oaks, I reflected really take up quite a bit of space. I had seen too many men die during those five years, not to imagine easily that Elziard Bouffier was dead. Bouffier, especially since at 20, one regard, regards men, especially since at 20, one regards men of 50 as old men with nothing left to do but die. He was not dead. As a matter of fact, he was extremely spry. He had changed jobs. Now he only had four sheep. Instead, he had 100 beehives. He had got rid of the sheep because they threatened his young trees. For, he told me, and I saw for myself, the war had disturbed him not at all. He had imperturbably continued to plant. The oaks of 1910 were then 10 years old and taller than either of us. It was an impressive spectacle. I was literally speechless and he did not talk. We spent the whole day walking in silence through his forest. In three sections, it measured 11 kilometers in length and three kilometers at its greatest width. When you remembered that all this had sprung from the hands and the soul of one man, without technical resources, 
you understand that men could be as effectual as God in realms other than that of destruction. He had pursued his plan in beech trees as high as my shoulder, spreading out as far as the eye could reach, confirmed it. He showed me handsome clumps of birch planted five years before, that is, in 1915, when I had been fighting at Verdun. He had set them out in all the valleys where he had guessed, and rightly, that there was moisture almost at the surface of the ground. They were as delicate as young girls, and very well established. Creation seemed to come about in a sort of chain reaction. He did not worry about it. He was determinedly pursuing his task in all its simplicity. But as we went back towards the village, I saw water flowing in brooks that had been dry since the memory of man. This was the most impressive result of chain reaction that I had seen. These dry streams had once long ago run with water. Some of the dreary villages I mentioned before had been built on the sites of ancient Roman settlements, traces of which still remained. And archeologists exploring there had found fish hooks where in the 20th century, cisterns were needed to assure a small supply of water. The wind too scattered seeds. As the water reappeared, so there reappeared willows, rushes, meadows, gardens, flowers, and a certain purpose in being alive. But the transformation took place so gradually that it became part of the pattern without causing any astonishment. Hunters climbing into the wilderness in pursuit of hares or wild boar had, of course, noticed the sudden growth of little trees, but had attributed it to some caprice of the earth. That is why no one meddled with Elziard Bouffier's work. He had been detected, if he had been detected. He would have been opposed. He would have had opposition. He was undetectable. Who in the villages or in the administration could have dreamed of such perseverance in a magnificent generosity? To have anything like a precise idea of this exceptional character, one must not forget that he worked in total solitude so that towards the end of his life, he lost the habit of speech. Or perhaps it was that he saw no need for it. In 1933, he received a visit from a forest ranger who notified him of an order against lighting fires out of doors for fear of endangering the growth of this natural forest. It was the first time the man told him naively that he had ever heard of a forest growing of its own accord. At that time, Bouffier was about to plant beeches at a spot some 12 kilometers from his cottage in order to avoid traveling back and forth, for he was then 75, he planned to build a stone cabin right at the plantation. The next year he did so. In 1935, a whole delegation came from the government to examine the natural forest. There was a high official from the forest service, a deputy, technicians. There was a great deal of ineffectual talk it was decided that something must be done, and fortunately nothing was done except the only helpful thing. The whole forest was placed under the protection of the state, and charcoal burning prohibited, for it was impossible not to be captivated by the beauty of those young trees in the fullness of health as they cast their spell over the deputy himself. A friend of mine was among the forestry officers of the delegation. To him, I explained the mystery. One day the following week, we went together to see Elziard Bouffier. We found him hard at work, some 10 kilometers from the spot where the inspection had taken place. This forester was not my friend for nothing. He was aware of values. He knew how to keep silence. 
I delivered the eggs I had brought as a present. We shared our lunch among the three of us and spent several hours in wordless contemplation of the countryside. In the direction from which we had come, the slopes were covered with trees, 20 to 25 feet tall. I remembered how the land had looked in 1913, a desert. Peaceful, regular toil, the vigorous mountain air, frugality and above all serenity in the spirits had endowed this old man with an awe-inspiring health. He was one of God's athletes. I wondered how many more acres he was going to cover with trees. In the direction from which we had come, the slopes were covered with trees. Thank you for your patience as I rewind and not repeat myself. I'm still learning the video editing and things, so this is just straight up, I hit play and record. Pause. Before leaving, my friend simply made a brief suggestion about certain species of trees that the soil here seemed particularly suited for. He did not force the point. For the very good reason, he told me later, that Bouffier knows more about it than I do. At the end of an hour's walking, having turned it over in his mind, he added, he knows a lot more about it than anybody. He's discovered a wonderful way to be happy. It was thanks to this officer that not only the forest, but also the happiness of this man was protected. He delegated three rangers to the task and so terrorized them that they remained proof against all the bottles of wine the charcoal burners could offer. The only serious danger to the work occurred during the War of 1939. As cars were being run on gasogenes, wood-burning generators, there was never enough wood. Cutting was started among the oaks of 1910, but the area was so far from any railway that the enterprise turned out to be financially unsound. It was abandoned. The shepherd had seen nothing of it. He was 30 kilometers away peacefully continuing his work, ignoring the war of 1939, as he had ignored that of 1914. I saw Elzear and Bouffier for the last time in June of 1945. He was then 87. I had started back along the rough through the wastelands, but now, in spite of the disorder in which the war had left the country, there was a bus running between the Ferrance Valley and the mountain. I attributed the fact that I no longer recognized the scenes of my earlier journeys to this relatively speedy transportation. It took the name of a village to convince me that I was actually in that region that had been at once all ruins and desolation. The bus put me down at Vergones. In 1913, this hamlet of 10 or 12 houses had three inhabitants. They had been savage creatures, hating one another, living by trapping game, little removed physically and morally from the conditions of prehistoric man. All about them, nettles were feeding upon the remains of abandoned houses. Their condition had been beyond help. For them, nothing to do but await death. A situation which rarely predisposes virtue. Everything was changed. Even the air. Instead of the harsh, dry winds that used to attack me, a gentle breeze was blowing, laden with scents. A sound like water came from the mountains. It was the wind in the forest. Most amazing of all, I heard the actual sound of water falling into a pool. I saw the fountain that had been built and that it flowed freely. And what touched me most that someone had planted a linden beside it. A linden that must have been four years old, already in full leaf, the incontestable symbol of resurrection. Besides, Vergones bore evidence of labor at the sort of undertaking for which hope is required. Hope, then, had returned. Ruins had been cleared away, dilapidated walls torn down, and five houses restored. 
Now there were 28 inhabitants, four of them young married couples. The new houses, freshly plastered, were surrounded by gardens where vegetables and flowers grew in orderly confusion. Cabbages and roses, leeks and snapdragons, celery and anemones. It was now a village where one would like to live. From that point, I went on foot. The war just finished had not allowed the full blooming of life, but Lazarus was out of the tomb. On the lower slopes of the mountain, I saw little fields of barley and rye. Deep in that narrow valley, the meadows were turning green. It has taken only the eight years since then for the whole countryside to glow with health and prosperity. On the sites of the ruins I had seen in 1913, now stand neat farms, cleanly plastered, testifying to a happy and comfortable life. The old streams, fed by the rains and snows that the forest conserves, are flowing again. Their waters have been channeled. On each farm, in groves of maples, fountain pools overflow onto carpets of fresh mint. Little by little, the villages have been rebuilt. People from the plains, where land is costly, have settled here, bringing youth, motion, and the spirit of adventure. Along the roads, you meet hardy men and women, boys and girls, who understand laughter and have recovered a taste for picnics. Counting the former population, unrecognizable now that they live in comfort, more than 10,000 people owe their happiness to Elzear de Bouffier. When I reflect that one man, one man armed with only his own physical and moral resources, was able to cause this land of Canaan to spring from the wasteland. I am convinced that, in spite of everything, humanity is admirable. But when I compute the unfailing greatness of spirit and the tenacity of benevolence that it must have taken to achieve this result, I am taken with an immense respect for that old and unlearned peasant who was able to complete a work worthy of God. Elziard Bouffier died peacefully in 1947 at the hospice in Benin. The end. If you have not fallen asleep already, and actually listened to the end of this. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this story time with Steph. And I can't wait to continue to let, to allow you to watch me grow and to share my story and give space for other people to share theirs. So again, thank you very much for your time. Remember the earth is sacred and you are too. Go in peace and be a blessing.